My topic for the day is about predictive modeling with topology. So topology is a field of mathematics, sort of like geometry, it's uh, concerned with the study of shape. And shape is not usually the way that we think about data, but the first thing that I want to convince you of today is that shape actually is the way to think about data. It's the shape of data that carries its meaning. So at IASI, we do something called topological data analysis, or TDA. And topological data analysis is based on this premise that data has shape, and the shape has meaning. And I claim that actually you already know this. You might not think about data in a spatial, geometric, topological way, but in fact, you use this fact that data has shape and shape has meaning whenever you do other analytics. So first example. Say you're fitting a linear regression. You're assuming that your data has the shape of a line. It's distributed near a line, at the very least, or a hyperplane in some high dimensional space. If your data doesn't have that shape, your linear model is not going to work very well. So that shape is the underlying assumption of the whole method. Now, when your data actually is linear, this works great. A linear model gives you a nice understanding of how some variables are related to other variables, it lets you do prediction, uh, and it compresses your data down from being a gigantic cloud of points into just a couple of coefficients in a model. So that's very useful. Sometimes your data is not linear. Maybe your data is clustered. Maybe you're using a clustering algorithm. Maybe you know how many clusters it has, maybe you don't, and maybe your algorithm requires that information, or maybe it doesn't. Um, but this is another shape that data can have. It's split into lots of different parts. And if your data, in fact, has that shape, it splits nicely into lots of clean different parts, your clustering algorithm will probably do a pretty nice job. Of course, if your data doesn't have that shape, your clustering algorithm will probably return nonsense. So it's the shape, again, that's driving the success of that strategy. OK, well, what if your data is not linear and it's not in clusters? What else could happen? What well, could be in loops? If you've worked with time series data, you might see something like this. A loop can often appear in data where there's some kind of recurrent or periodic behavior. Maybe you have some methods for dealing with loops. I mean, they exist. They're a little more obscure, but these kind of technologies are out there. Um, so that's another shape that data can have. How about this one, flares? This is actually a really common shape that data can have, right? There's some kind of centralized behavior that's the most common thing, and then there's different abnormalities that, have, that appear as different skews in the data in different directions, right? This is actually something that we see um, roughly this shape in uh, diabetes data sets, where you measure, say, different physiological indicators of diabetes, and you, you look at, uh, well, it's a high dimensional space, but when you, when you compress it down, you see a shape roughly like this, that there are pre-diabetic people and, and people with no form of diabetes. There are type 1 diabetic people going off in one direction. There are type 2 diabetic people going off in another direction. So this is a perfectly reasonable shape that data can have, but do we have any methods for dealing with it in particular? Not really. The real problem is that complex data could have all of these shapes. It could have all of these shapes in combination. Um, it could have shapes that aren't up here at all. And what we have in current analytics techniques is a method for dealing with each shape. If the data is linear, we fit linear regression. If the data is clustered, we use clustering algorithms. If the data shows loops, we use whatever algorithms you want to use to find loops. Right? And maybe if you know that your data has flares, maybe you separate it into the different flares and analyze each one independently. Right? But really, at some point, you have to stop producing cottage industries for each shape, and you have to deal with shape as a whole. And that's the idea that data has shape and shape matters. So what we tried to do at IASDI is produce a compressed representation of your data that shows you all of those shapes at once. Whatever shape your data has, without having to know it in advance, we want to map that out for you and show it to you in a way that you can actually use as the foundation for further analysis. So why do you need to map out the shape first? Well, I hinted you know, a few minutes ago that if you've, if you've got the shape wrong, then your analytical technique's not going to work very well. So if your data is not really clustered, then clustering algorithms aren't going to perform very well. Um, I'm going to argue that worse yet, I mean, I think it's very unlikely that you do know the shape of your data in advance. So first of all, we're not in the realm of scientific theory, right? We're not physicists who know that two physical quantities ought to have a linear relationship for, with each other, and therefore we can go looking for that. So we don't have theory to guide us in what the shape of the data ought to be. Um, the data we deal with in industry is often very high dimensional. 
really, really high dimensional sometimes, and we don't have a good handle, like humans don't have a good handle on how to visualize or describe high dimensional shapes. And finally, data often comes to us with the wrong coordinates. So partly this is because you never measure what you actually want to measure, right? You measure what you have available. And then you hope that that captures the same information as some kind of proxy of what you want to measure. But so what does it look like when data comes to you with the wrong coordinates? I'm going to argue that it obscures the shape. Right? So this data actually has a really simple shape. This data is actually two circles. What are the two circles? Well, there's a blue circle there. And if you look from the right angle, you see the blue circle. And there's a green circle. And if you look from the right angle, you see the green circle. But there's no angle from which you see the blue circle and the green circle at the same time. Right? There's no way to project this data so that you see two circles. But fundamentally, that's what's there. And if you had the right coordinates on your data, you would see just two circles. So this is what I mean that a, even a relatively simple shape can be obscured because your data comes to you with the wrong coordinates. If you could do the right transformation, you would see both those circles at the same time. What all this boils down to is that you'd like to have a method to capture the shape of your data before you start the rest of your analytical work that can capture the shape of your data regardless of what shape it started with. Right? So you shouldn't need to know what shape the data is first. You should have a method that can capture any shape and lay it out for you from the beginning. So how do we do that? So this is a toy example to show you the algorithm that we use to create uh, those network diagrams that I showed you a minute ago. So suppose at this point cloud is your data. So this is just a, you know, an XY plot of some two-dimensional data. Don't worry about the coloring for the moment, right? It's just a, a point cloud of data. We all see that it's a circle, right? So how can we capture mathematically the fact that this is a circle? So here's the method. First, choose some function uh, to color your data. Color it by a real valued function. Okay. That means to each data point, assign a single real number. And the way we're doing that in this example is we're going to color by height. Okay. So red to blue based on top to bottom. In the image of that function, bin the data. So we're going to make a top bin, a second highest bin, a second lowest bin, and a bottom bin. Now the bins are overlapping. That's why you're seeing the orange points double up and split apart. Okay? Because the top bin and the second to top bin, they overlap. And then that overlaps with the second to bottom bin, and that overlaps with the bottom bin. So you take your function, height, you bin in the image of that function. Within each bin, you run your favorite clustering algorithm. Doesn't really matter which one. So in the top bin, those red and orange points, they form an arc. And so there's really just one cluster there, that top red cluster. So you've got these overlapping bins. Inside each one, you cluster the data. And then because the bins had overlap, some data points ended up in more than one cluster. Right? So the orange data points in the original circle, they split apart. They ended up in that top bin and this one. And these orange points over on the other side, they ended up in the top bin and the one on the right. So when that happens, you connect the corresponding clusters with an edge, and the output is a graph. And hooray, the graph is a circle, right? It captures the original shape. Um, and it captures it with much less information than the original point cloud of data, right? Just like the linear model takes you from giant point cloud uh, <coughs> space along a hyperplane down to a few coefficients in a model, this takes you from giant point cloud um, shaped like a circle to 6.6 six edges. So it's a combinatorial simplified representation. So the cool thing about this algorithm is actually it captures complex shapes just as well as it captures simple ones. So this is sort of a classical problem uh, for, for machine learning algorithms. Can you separate the red and the blue spirals, right? And most algorithms have a really hard time with this. Um, with the algorithm I just described, this is actually really easy. In fact, there are, I can think of several different ways to do it. And what you will produce, the graph that you will produce is shown on the right. There will be a red graph that's all connected. There will be a blue graph that's all connected. And the key here is that this algorithm sees the topology of the data. It sees that there are two connected pieces, a blue piece that's all connected. All the blue stuff is connected to all the blue stuff. 
All the red stuff is connected to all the red stuff. And the fact that it's wound into a spiral, topologically, is not important. So that's why it unrolls exactly the way that you think it should. So there are a lot of other examples. If you go through sort of the standard literature on the, the challenges for machine learning algorithms, you know, um, this algorithm tends to work very, very well to separate your data regardless of what bizarre shape it might have. The shape is the first step then in your analytical process. That once you understand the shape, uh, you can do a better job at the later stages. And in particular, I think that shape is a good foundation to start with um, to build good models. So I'm going to show a couple of examples of how we do that at IASD. Um, but, but first, you know, let's go from the, the toy models with the small networks to, to the real thing that is produced by the software. So our software produces pictures like the ones on the right. Now these are the same kinds of uh, graphs with nodes and edges between them that you saw with the circle you know, becoming a hexagon. There are just many, many more nodes and edges in those pictures than there were on the toy model. So when you look at an image like this, like the ones on the right, what you remember is from the algorithm, right, the nodes came from clusters of data points. It came from applying the clustering algorithm within a single bin. So nodes on the right represent clusters of similar data points. And there are edges whenever those clusters had some overlap. So edges on the right represent, connect similar nodes. We color the networks in various different ways as a visual tool. Um, and the position of the nodes on the screen doesn't matter. Right? So that graph that we were producing as output, it's, it's not important. Even though I used height, it's, it's not important exactly where you place the nodes on the screen. It's, it's the fact that the graph has a circle. Or it's the fact that the graph splits into three parts, or whatever the case might be. So this is kind of the legend for how we interpret these graphs. Here's a first example of how understanding shape can improve your modeling. These two images are both the same network. They're a network produced on a data set of online transactions. Um, so each node, it's hard to see individual nodes and edges in this. Um, the visuals aren't super focused. Uh, but there are individual nodes and edges in there. So each node represents a collection of online transactions that were clustered into the same group, right? which means that they're very similar. So nodes represent clusters of similar transactions. Parts of the network where all the nodes are connected together by a lot of edges, and there are very like, dense regions of the network, those are regions of lots of similar online transactions. So roughly speaking, when you, when you read this network map, right, what you see is that there's, um, there's a main component of transactions here, this kind of three-part structure. right, And that main component. Um, is showing a flared structure, it's showing that there are kind of three subparts there of transactions that are all distinct from, you know, similar within a flare, but distinct across different flares. And then there's a number of smaller components, these little red and blue islands here, where all the transactions in those components are similar to each other, but they're very different from everything else in the network. So that's how I kind of read a picture like this. And then the color schemes are very simple, actually. On the left, the color scheme is by ground truth fraud. We're, this is a fraud detection model, okay? And we have ground truth. All the fraud, almost all the fraud is in these two red islands here. There's a tiny little bit down there on the right. There's some uh, tiny little parts of the network that are also fraud, okay? On the right is the predictions of, uh, of a customer model. So red on the left means these, there was a high proportion of fraud in, these in this group of transactions. Red on the right means the model predicted that there would be a high proportion of fraud in these transactions. Okay. So as you compare, right, you see that there, is a, there are a lot of false positives. Right. There are several different regions here where there's red on the right, but no red on the left. And that, those are places where the model is seeing false positives. So first of all, there's a, this is a very like, visual approach to where is the model producing errors? Where are the false positives? And equally as well, you know, it wasn't true in this case, but equally we could have seen false negatives, right? which would have been regions of red on the left that were blue on the right. In fact, in the software, you can highlight one and see where it corresponds on the other side, and it's very nice. So this is a nice visual way to understand, um, to do model evaluation. 
But there's actually something deeper going on here, right? Because what you're really doing here is saying, my model is performing well in this region and poorly in this region. But what is region? Right? Region was created by the algorithm. It was created by the unsupervised clustering um, style algorithm that I showed to you at the beginning. So what this algorithm has done is to organize the data, organize it into this one main component with the three parts, organize it into these smaller little islands. Right? And it's based on that organization, that novel organization, that we're saying, oh, the model performs well here and poorly here. Right? It's a more multivariate way of doing model evaluation than if you had just said, I'm going to check whether my model performs better you know, in country A or country B or country C. I'm going to check whether my model performs better for high, high dollar figure trans uh, transactions, middle or low. Right? Instead of doing that specific slicing, we're letting the data organize itself and using that organization as our method for saying, where is it performing well or poorly? So in a similar vein, topology can guide model creation. So if you didn't have a model to start with, you didn't have a model to evaluate, um, topology can guide you in creating one. So this is a map um, of a data set that is uh, insurance claims submitted by a hospital system to various insurance companies. And the red indicates uh, groups of claims where there are an unusually high number of denials or rejections where the insurance company refused to pay. Right? And what you see is that there are a number of different hotspots circled which represent the fact that when an insurance company decides not to pay a claim, it's not always for the same reason. Right? It's for many different possible reasons. And you're seeing that in the many different possible hotspots of denials and rejections in this network. And what this suggests in terms of modeling, if you want to make a model predicting for a given claim, is this likely to be denied, right? You should focus, you should model these different areas differently. The structure of the data is such that the claims inside each hotspot are similar to each other. You can try to predict them all at once. But across different hotspots, those claims are pretty different. And if you try to come up with a model that's going to predict both of them well, that's that's probably going to be difficult. So the topology guides model creation. Um, what does this really come down to? It really comes down to building local models. Right? So what I'm saying is that <coughs> the shape tells you how to focus in specifically on different regions of your data and build local models on those different regions. So why is that good? You can build local models in any number of ways. Why should you build it using topology, you know, based on the shape? Well, the idea is that topology is the way to get your local models to be more principled. And this is important, right, because the, the trade-off for building local models is overfitting. If you slice your data too finely and you build a local model on every tiny little piece of your data, you're, you're probably going to overfit and it's not going to work very well. So you want, when you're making local models, you want to make sure that you are that you're going only as local as necessary so that you don't run into overfitting problems. So why does topology let you do that? So this is a, a toy example again of, of what your data might look like, right? So say you're trying to separate the green from the blue. Right? If you're trying to use, say, an SVM, some simple linear decision boundary, right? This is a classic case. You can't do it. There's no linear decision boundary that separates green from blue. Fine. Not a big deal. Split the data in half along one of the coordinate axes, and now you can make a local model on the left and a local model on the right, and each one of those local models will be no problem. It'll fit just fine. But here's a more complicated situation. Again, with the green and the blue, there's no single plane that you can draw that will separate green from blue. You need to build some local models to separate green from blue. But now you can't just slice vertically or slice horizontally. right? Any vertical slice, any horizontal slice, you won't separate this into two pieces that you, can, that you can model cleanly on either side. OK, you say, but that's not a big deal. There's still a line. I'll draw the line like this, and I'll build a local model on the top, and I'll build a local model on the bottom, and both those models would be great. And then I say, what about this? Now, not only is there no line you can draw to separate green from blue, there's no line you can draw that will result in two clean local models. There's this curve, but are you ever going to find that? So the problem is, 
you need to understand the shape of the data to understand how to separate it into the right place, pieces on which you can build those local models. And again, it's the topology that lets you do that. I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, topology lets you build nice principled local models, improves uh, existing models, and um, understanding the shape of your data is a great first step towards a good analytics. This algorithm works just fine for whatever dimension of data you have, right? You need to have whatever data set you have as your input. You have one or actually maybe more real valued functions that you apply for it, apply to it, you <laughs> do this algorithm. What you produce is a graph. Yes. And that graph has no intrinsic, um, well, that's not true. That graph only requires two dimensions to visualize. Um, you can, you know, it might be folded over on itself. You might have to pull it around a little bit. <coughs> but it's a low dimensional visualization. We use dimensionality al reduction algorithms in various ways, but what's getting you from that really high dimensional data set down to the graph is really the algorithm that I showed, right? It's not any additional dimensionality reduction on top of that. We use dimensionality reduction algorithms as inputs sometimes, as for example, the, the function on which you bin the data but there's not like secretly a dimensionality reduction step that I'm skipping. So there's not a dimension choice for me, but there is a choice about how to look at the data. So depending on which function we use to, to build the network, um, you, you may well get different shapes. Um, all of those shapes are valid, they're just different ways of looking at the data, just like different projections would give you different ways of looking at the data. In practice, what I do is I have a couple of favorite functions that I like to use, um, geometric ones, statistical ones, uh, sometimes others, and make the networks based on several different choices of function, and then I can usually infer back to what the original data space must have looked like. There are two answers. So the algorithm that creates the networks is the one that I showed you with the binning and then the clustering within bins. And that's the algorithm that produces the graph. The input for other algorithms is in, is in the function that's, use, that's used to do the binning. So for example, I used height to do the binning on the circle. You can instead use a density estimator. You could instead use PCA one and two. You could instead use anything that produces a real valued output. And um, actually, there's a nice example here. So this is an example of a data set. You, you, you can't see the original, but this is the output of PCA. It looks like there are three clusters here. Um, if you use PCA as your function on which you do the binning, right, then within each small range of the PCA coordinates, you're, doing, you're going back to the original data space and doing clustering, which means that you know, if you think about the data space as living above this above this PCA plane, right? There may have been two clusters that got projected down onto each other because they were in the same, PC they were, they were um, what separated them was orthogonal to the P PCA plane. And so in this, this is a specific example um, where that was the case. And if you do the algorithm that I described, you actually see that there are four clusters and you, you lost one of them through projection loss in PCA. Um, so that's one way that other algorithms come into play. Okay, thank you.